All right. So like I said in the introduction, I'm here with Dr. Adam Back and Samson Mao. Gentlemen, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Preston. Thanks for having us on. Hey, so you guys, uh, you know, I'm checking Twitter and I'm seeing these feeds coming out of the Blockstream website. And uh, you guys got some big news to announce. The first thing was this uh, announcement of this modular mining unit. Uh, you guys are just going by uh, the acronym MNU. Talk to us about what this is and what kind of problem you're trying to solve. So it's to uh, take mining closer to the power producers and provide them with a way to increase the um, sort of to have a steady base load and increase the profitability of being a power generator. And particularly for some intermittent power sources, they are, you know, they, when they build a new sort of zero emission um, installation, sometimes it takes an extended period of time until they get connected to the grid. So this is something that can provide them with immediate power. And then also the, um, the grid demands are variable and maybe the power generation is variable too. So, you know, they're, they're in a business, they're trying to make an economic case to get uh, project financing to build a zero emission, like, a, you know, a solar farm, wind farm, hydro farm, that kind of thing. And they have to make an economic case for it. And so having a kind of buyer of last resort that's standing by to buy any excess power helps them economically uh, to achieve the project financing. And so, you know, what's uh, the, one of the differences with the Blockstream Energy or Modular Mining Unit is that the, um, the power producer buys the unit or leases it in some form. So it's their equipment. And in exchange for that, they have the right to sell power to it. And so they are not exposed by default to the Bitcoin price. They're just able to sell power at what is for bulk power producers an attractive price. And the reason we're willing to pay this attractive price is because we want the Bitcoins and they've, uh, you know, they've bought the miner effectively, right? So we can, if you, if you, buy the miner and pay the electricity, you want a lower electricity bill. If you're only paying the electricity bill, you can afford to pay a higher power rate. And so we can pay an attractive power rate. And if they end up selling all of their power to mining, that's great. If they have high grid demands, that's fine too. That just means they made their profit in a, in a different way. So in a way, it's kind of a, a black box that you're providing to energy producers and they are effectively mining, but they don't necessarily need to know or, or deal with that aspect of it. They just have this uh, machine that buys power from them and it can make their operations far more profitable. How much more energy, and I know this varies from energy producer to energy producer, but uh, what are you guys going after? Is it a 20% additional energy capacity for, a, for your standard energy company that they're kicking off that they're just not using and they need that that uh, additional 20% to handle peak demand, or is it even larger than that? Uh, it depends on the type of power, but certainly, you know, most grids are built for the peak power. And so they have significant unused power. And of course, many power sources can be run at variable levels so they can just turn it down when the uh, power demands are lower. But to give an example in in a Montreal, Quebec province of um, Canada, about 50% of the power is un unused. So it's, uh, it's mostly hydro. So it's, you know, just uh, bypassing the generators and pouring out the sluice gates. And so, you know, that's in sort of missed economic opportunity. They could sell that to mining. And of course, if there was a surge in power demands, they could turn the mining off, right? So. Now, other kinds of power are, are variable for different reasons. One is, you know, solar obviously only works in the, in the daylight unless you have batteries as well. And wind depends on the wind speed. So, and similarly, the power demands are variable. You know, people turning on, uh, yeah. you know, eating or having a hot drink at the same time after watching a, a football match or something, it, there are sort of spikes for 
residential power habit reasons and for industrial working hour, you know, reasons when people are operating industrial plants. So the power demands are all over the place. And some of these power generation methods are um, relatively efficient, but take a while to start up and a while to stop to, to wind down. And so when they're producing the power, it has to go somewhere. You can't just, you know, keep generating it and not, not draw it. It will break something like in the grid. And so they actually at times have to pay people negative power rates to get rid of temporary excess power as well. So mining can also fulfill that purpose. But meanwhile, we have somebody from Forbes who's probably writing an article right now about how the energy use is going to uh, take over the, the entire planet here in about six months uh, with Bitcoin mining. The power is coming out, right? So like here you got these waterfalls or however they're har- harvesting the energy from the, from the hydro dams. And um, I mean, it's going to produce this energy one way or the other. It's coming out. It's just... It's just there for the taking. So yeah, it's actually, uh, energy is quite abundant. Just our ability to harness and transport or transmit it is quite limited. And I think yeah. mining will be driving a lot of advancement in, in this sector to you know, improve upon that and better harness energy overall. So I think there's a net positive here. Like you need some new technology that moves things forward. And the yeah. demand... From, for Bitcoin mining and the economic bonus that gives you is that potential factor that can push us ahead techn- technologically. So Adam, you initially described like, hey, we'll lease this, we'll come, we'll set it up, we'll service it, and uh, you pay us, we like come up with an agreement with what en- energy rate we'll pay for, uh, that you'll be providing to the, the mining rig, um, and we want to keep the Bitcoin. Do you find yourself in a situation where you think uh, energy producers are going to say, nah, just, just give us the uh, MNU itself and uh, we'll, we'll keep the Bitcoin? Are you guys at that point or do you think that they kind of like the, the structure of this right now? Well, I mean, for sort of conventional infrastructure, they, uh, they may not be that familiar with Bitcoin. So, you know, the prospect of just getting paid conventionally for the power with a power purchase agreement sounds good to them. And of course, you know, large scale bulk power at the generation point is uh, relatively low cost. So that could be win-win, but you know, there are other people we work with like Acker, for example, uh, CT, who are, you know, they funded their new division for Bitcoin activities with Bitcoin. And so, you know, they're obviously much more interested in in getting the Bitcoin. So, you know, we can construct a different way to um, make that work economically. It's, no it's kind of a Trojan horse because they, they will like this model now if they're not familiar with Bitcoin, Bitcoin mining and the economic benefits. But down the road, if they do learn more about it, then you know, we can shift the model a bit and orange pill them. Why are we letting these guys keep the Bitcoin and they're paying us the... <laughs> yeah, I love it. Um, talk to us about where you're at on the development of the MNU itself, because it looks like it's it's coming as a package deal. Had the sleek block stream logo on the side of it, and you guys obviously have all the the hardware and infrastructure inside set up. You're providing the service labor to make sure this thing is is running around the clock in case it runs into any hiccups which I wouldn't suspect anybody wants to try to take that on themselves that you would be leasing this to anyway. Um, But how far along are you guys in that process? Have you shipped any? Are you still in the developmental phase? Talk to us about where you're at. So we have uh, MMUs running, but obviously we're interested to scale that up a lot more and, you know, place them around the world in uh, sites that have, I mean, sometimes remote sites also. So we have the technology to uh, operate these using the Blockstream satellite. So we do have a bi-directional version of the satellite, um, which we've used for, you know, as a, as a, as a backup to networking for mining or as a, you know, potentially as a primary. Obviously, you know, at this point, miners are in relatively short supply. And so that's one of the, the bottlenecks for Bitcoin mining generally, actually. 
not only do you guys have this announcement, you have another massive announcement that just came out today and we're recording this in the future, but it's, it's going to, when this airs, it's coming out today, you guys are getting into the ASICs business. So I'm sure everybody, everybody out there is hearing this announcement, just saying, Oh my God. So talk to us about this. What in the world is going on at Blockstream with respect to ASICs? Well, I mean, it's obviously a big part of the, um, mining space and if you're you know providing hosting to individuals and to companies access to supply chain for miners is a is a factor and so you know we we work with a number of uh, manufacturers today but we're interested to add some more decentralization so an additional manufacturer um, built you know sort of more in the West and internationally, there's a lot of manufacturing that's China centric today. So it's good to have some kind of geographic diversity of where things are made. And uh, yeah, so we, you know, um, obviously when there's a shortage for miners, as is the case today, the, the supply and demand situations, the prices tend to go up as well, reflecting that. So it's also a good time economically to enter this space. Now, um, you know, people are looking at the announcement, but actually we've been, you know, working on this for probably a couple of years in the background and under wraps and with both Spondulis, uh, who, you know, if you look around on the internet, you'll see that they've been uh, making miners for a while. And, and the Spondulis team is joining Blockstream to uh, form the Blockstream Mining Division. So we've been working with them and the Foundry partner uh, for, for a while now. And so we're projecting to have them in market uh, Q3 next year, which is, I think, faster than people would assume if you just think that you know somebody's uh, starting an activity and usually the R&D phase on a, on a new miner would take you know in excess of a year. And I think another factor with mining is it's a very specialized area. You need to have deep expertise. Many people who've tried it, you know, from scratch have run into issues or, you know, failed runs. Even some of the big companies have had uh, technical failures. So we have a lot of confidence in the Spondulis team. They've made some very nice equipment in the past, which uh, we owned and operated in the past. Um, and so we're you know, very interested to bring a quality enterprise grade miner to, to market. And so you guys are going to have a lot of IP in this, or are you piecing together a lot of different components that doesn't necessarily have IP for, for Blockstream? I'm just trying to understand how much of the manufacture you guys are, are doing and how much of the intellectual property for the initial launch of it. Yeah. So the way the acquisition of Spondylis is structured is uh, actually as an IP purchase. Um, now, of course, you know, Blockstream is, um, you know, has, has participated in the kind of defensive license activities. So we're generally a fan of open intellectual property um, to, you know, to create a level playing field. But obviously some of the um, chip level libraries and foundry level technologies are covered by patents outside of our control. So, you know, we're generally operating in the defensive pattern uh, mode as usual, but uh, that's, that's the way the deal structured. And, you know, we're, we're planning a, a roadmap for these uh, miners. So we'll, we'll seek to, um, you know, Im improve the space over time. Samson, did you have anything else you wanted to add about the, the announcement? Yeah. So I think touching upon what Adam was mentioning, I, this is a, a major thing for the Bitcoin mining industry. Uh, there have been very few manufacturers outside of China, and that does pose some sort of a risk to the Bitcoin network if all the production and manufacturing and everything is based in one geographical region. So, you know, having Spondylis uh, under, under Blockstream now helps us to decentralize the production of uh, Bitcoin miners. And I think if we can grow this business to the extent we want to, then we could become a potentially major competitor in this space and grab a large chunk of that market share from the other manufacturers as well. Um, 
I think traditionally Spondylis has been known for aiming for more professional grade miners. Like they were one of the first to try the um, the one U form factor, whereas everyone else was doing the you know the shoebox style Bitcoin miners. And I think we want to keep on going in that direction and aim for more enterprise grade hardware. Um, it's just easier to manage, and I think we'll be able to gain an advantage in that area because um, you, you can, if you standardize the form factor, you can standard a lot more things and you know swap out chips easier when they burn out or when they're uh, no longer uh, you know cutting edge and just replace the parts that you need to replace huh. uh, I think a lot of miners are designed with the obsolescence in mind but I think what we want to go for is you know minimizing waste on that side and optimizing for efficiency that's really interesting to hear you talk about the swappability of various components inside the rig itself. And I think that that's going to be a welcome change for many people in the space to be able to upgrade without, you know, the cost of replacing every single component inside the rig. Let's go ahead and transition to Blockstream Finance. Adam, the last time we talked, you were getting ready to do your minor note. For people that maybe didn't hear that conversation, explain to them what the note is. And then I'm just, I'm just kind of curious how it turned out for the first tranche that you guys did with the issuance. Uh, yes. Yeah. So the Blockstream mining note it was sort of reactive. We had, you know, people were aware that we were doing, providing mining hosting for enterprises and in, individuals were interested to invest. And so we got a lot of inbound requests. And so the Blockstream mining note was partly a, you know, a way to satisfy that demand. And so it is actually a security token. So it's a proper... Um, security. It's via a Luxembourg securitization vehicle provided by Stocker, which is a equivalent of a share registration agent for for the note. And uh, financially, it's structured a little bit different. So, sort of, um, we used the model that we arrived at ourselves by mining for a number of years, which is to uh, fund it and not sell the coins as you go. So, keep the coins to the end, um, and. So it's pre-funded. It's a three-year note, and you know it's approximately the useful lifetime of a miner these days, plus or minus. And so, yeah, it basically accrues the Bitcoin inside the note, and at the end of the period, the current holder would receive the Bitcoin. And because it's um, a liquid security, you know, an actual security token, users can transact it. So today they can transact OTC and there seems to be a decent amount of OTC uh, transactions occurring. Um, and there's a Blockstream finance channel where people seem to be meeting other buyers. And we're also expecting uh, one or more exchange listings in, you know, in some months. And so that will provide uh, another, you know, hopefully price formation and, we can find out what the market pricing is for this kind of product. Obviously, it's sort of loosely fungible with other um, mining activities that you can do. And so, you know, there should be some kind of correlation between the prices of different things in the mining space. Now, the, the mining note is, you know, if you, if you sell it before maturity, you would expect the current value to reflect both the Bitcoin component and the remaining mining component. So let's say you sold it one year into three year period and it accumulated a certain number of Bitcoin, that will be part of it. Plus, you know, the remaining 24 months value on the contract. And actually today, you know, so far it's been, people got more interested and wish they'd bought earlier. Basically we've done two sales tranches and we'll probably do another one. And then obviously the exchange listings later. So I think people like to see something operating Otherwise, they feel like they're buying it on spec and it's coming in three months, which was the original tranche right back in March. And so, you know, there seems to be more interest in uh, buying it on a secondary market now. Um, and it's been going pretty well. You know, as I said, the minor profitability is quite high at present. It's been making a return of about 0.3% uh, a day. So if it were to keep going at that trajectory, it would have recouped the capital investment uh, within a year and it's a three-year product. Now, of course, you know, many uh, inputs to mining are variable, the Bitcoin price, the hash rate. Of course, the hash rate depends on supply of uh, ASICs and other people, you know, building up power infrastructure and 
securing ASICs and putting them online. So we'll see how that how that plays out. But it's uh, you know people have been pleased with it so far. Yeah, it's quite interesting. Like uh, when we were socializing the concept of the BMN, one of the biggest questions we get is you know why not just buy Bitcoin? Why why buy this? And you know we we have uh, back tested models where in certain situations it does uh, become more profitable to mine Bitcoin than to buy Bitcoin. Uh, but you know, typically those are during bear markets and, and such. But you can also have that when there is a big drop in hash rate. So the timeliness of the BMN is just great. You know, it, it launched and then there was that massive crackdown in China, and you had that mass exodus of miners, uh, you know, leaving or, or just shutting down. Period. And the profitability, as I mentioned, just spiked on the BMN. If you're looking at that just as investing in a traditional financial instrument, you just ignore the Bitcoin mining part, you know, you're doing excellent, uh, you're getting excellent yields on this instrument here. So I think a lot of people were very happy. And you know, that's why people are, are trading at OTC now, because they they want more of it. And uh, the people that bought early were just very prescient. And, you know, they look like they're geniuses. I would suspect that your, your variance would be way lower by owning this versus owning Bitcoin itself, just as far as the variability in, in the price of the security. Yeah, it's That's... kind of a, a locked in dollar cost average. You know, <laughs> you've committed to it and you're going to average over time no matter what. So in, in some ways, it's better than dollar cost averaging because you kind of you're locked in and you're locked in at a specific uh, rate of acquisition. Yeah, I mean, certainly in the back testing, it appears to be the case. Um, that you get a lower volatility of return. And that's partly because there's some downside protection historically. So, you know, if the hash rate, if the price falls, the hash rate falls, you mine more coins than you expected to because of the mining strategy baked into it, you keep the coins to the end. And usually across the three year period, you know, there'll be a price fall and a price rise of some significance. And so we, we actually did something like that a few years ago uh, at company level. And so basically we started uh, mining when a price of this particular batch of miners at a time when the price of Bitcoin was $15,000. And at the end of the duration, the price was $7,500, but we still made a 25% profit. So if you're looking at a buying Bitcoin, you'd have lost 50%. We made a 25% return instead. And if you, you know, at the time we were, we found this surprising. And so we, you know, we embarked on all this analysis and back testing to see, you know, how often that kind of thing would occur, what the average is, basically to break apart why that happened. It's because at the bottom of the market, the price fell to, you know, 3,500 or something. And so basically it mined two and a half times as many coins as we projected. And so even though the price was half, it ended up making a 25% return at the end. And of course, you know, in effect, we ended up keeping those coins to this state, at which point, you know, that looks very good overall compared to the dollar in, into it. But I think it's a very good, you know, people don't have the intuition, so they will often put money into mining where they'll pay the power bills uh, by selling some of the Bitcoin. And that's that's not a good idea in our view because what you end up doing is selling most of the coins at the bottom of the market because you know the percentage of the coins you have to sell is related to the price. And at the bottom, it's getting near to break even and you'll be selling like a big portion of the coins. And that's when you're accumulating and that's what you know ultimately provides the downside protection and return. So we reflected that in a BMN note structure basically so it's pre the power is pre-funded it keeps 100 percent of the coins and it has a relatively uh cost efficient uh, administration fee for, so i think you yeah. can kind of say uh, there's two kinds of miners there are the miners that are just in it for the profit and it may make sense at a certain point in time to do what adam was saying which is you know they just sell off some coins every month to pay for the power and they're still incredibly profitable, right? The cost to mine, mine one Bitcoin right now is, you know, six, seven thousand dollars, and the price is pretty high right now. It's, uh, you know, four, 49, 48, 49. But um, there's another type of miner, which is the the hodler miner. So that miner is really mining to hodl, 
and like for us we mine and we keep everything like we, we're not selling off every month to pay the bills or pay operational costs and in effect the bmn is turning people into the, the hodler type miners because they're locked in for that three-year period so they will accrue those benefits uh, because of that structure i would think that so for a lot of institutions right now they can't get access to bitcoin just through sheer charter limitations does this vehicle provide them an opportunity to invest in a debt instrument that kind of bypasses some of those charter limitations that they might have by uh, forcing them to own some type of debt instrument? Yeah, we've, we've actually seen that play out. So we had a couple of people express interest and financial institutions that had those kind of internal policy question marks where they don't yet know how to institutionally own Bitcoin, but they can own a Luxembourg security. And so I think they felt that it was a, a good way to start, basically, because at the end of it, they'll have Bitcoin and they'll have the option to, you know, receive the dollar equivalent or the euro equivalent. But, you know, by then they may be in a position to take physical possession take of the coins. Yeah. So they're, they might have to sell on the open market. They might have to sell it a day before the maturity, which I'm... I'm guessing the the price of this is just basically going to peg itself straight to whatever underlying Bitcoin's associated with the account right before it matures. So they're able to sell it on the secondary market or in the public market right before it matures, and then they bypass all of this. But yeah, like you said, maybe maybe by then they'll be able to take physical custody of the of the coupon. Yeah, I think there's three ways to do it. Either you're buying an, a Bitcoin tracker, an ETF, or something like the BMN. Uh, but all are viable ways for those those types of entities to hold Bitcoin indirectly, I think. Um, and I think there is an added benefit of holding the BMN because it is a Luxembourg security. Uh, it will have an ISIN number. It can be you know, held by any securities broker or any type of financial um, entity like that. So it, it plays very well into that kind of uh, market segment. So when, so it, when are you going to do it in the U.S.? <laughs> we're working on that. <laughs> we're working with INX. So we'll see what we can do. Oh, okay. All right. So, and it, I mean, I think another advantage of it being a security is that brokerages will give uh, margin credit, basically. Uh, so a credit line for trading or other purposes held against the stocks and bonds in a portfolio. So, so you, I potentially don't think you... a way to get leverage against a Bitcoin related product. I think with the grayscale, you cannot borrow against it, but you could borrow against a, a BMN. Oh, that's interesting. So let, let's go down that path because that was the next path I wanted to talk to you guys about. So you got a lot of people out there. They have substantial Bitcoin positions. They don't want to sell, them, right? They, they'll do anything to avoid selling their Bitcoin to pay for whatever expense they might have. So if they want to go buy a house. Let's say they want to buy a $500,000 house. And let's say they got $500,000 worth of Bitcoin. They're not going to sell their Bitcoin, realize the capital gains and buy the house. They want to borrow, you know, they want to, they want to put down a down payment of 50 or a hundred thousand dollars and they want to use their Bitcoin in order to basically take out a loan to put down the down payment or whatever that is, whatever gymnastics we want to play with this. But anyone who understands Bitcoin isn't going to sell it. So how are you guys thinking about providing a solution to that quandary? Um, for anybody that understands Bitcoin and wanting to use it to buy real estate or any type of large expense in their life. Right. So as, as you know, we acquired um, Adamant Capital and we've branded that and, or rolled it into Blockstream Finance. So the BMN is issued under the Blockstream Finance umbrella, but we do have plans to uh, launch a number of uh, innovative Bitcoin instruments. Um, we're thinking about doing a, an alpha fund. So similar to the one that Adamant was doing originally. So uh, you invest Bitcoin and you get returns on Bitcoin. Uh, we've kicked around the idea of doing a US dollar alpha fund. Uh, I'm calling it the plunge protection fund. So this would be a US dollar fund where we would take some of the, the capital to invest in uh, you know, stable yield uh, areas and then take some of it just to place limit orders and buy Bitcoin whenever there's a big dip. So in effect, it's <laughs> plunge protection. But uh, Adam, and, Adam and I also talked about doing some uh, mort mortgages under the Blockstream Finance brand too, because I think that 
is something that Bitcoiners do want. You know? So much like you said, people don't want to sell, but they want to no. say buy a house or a, an apartment or something. Yeah, I mean, I think the key is to get the lending rates down because mortgage lending rates are quite low with you know, zero interest rate policies and so on. Um, and Bitcoin related finance rates tend to be quite high because there's a shortage of dollars uh, to use for leverage in the system. You know, I think that's because ultimately anybody who's interested in Bitcoin tends to get heavily invested into Bitcoin and run low on dollars. And so, you know, they've, ex they've largely exhausted their dollar liquidity and that puts the price up of Bitcoin related dollar liquidity. And of course, you know, there are large amounts of fiat in the, in the system in general, you know, in fixed income, in bonds, in uh, pension funds that are getting very, very low rates. And so, you know, you would wonder that those two things should normalize eventually. But I think for the moment, they're hesitant to place funds into Bitcoin uh, exchange margin lending and things like that. So it means that at least so far, the lending rates against Bitcoin have been a bit high to use as, you know, collateral for a house, let's say. So, I mean, as, as you were hinting, one thing that people could do, and I, I expect some people are doing this, is take a you know, smaller loan against Bitcoin, like a 10% loan against Bitcoin, put it as a down payment, and then get a conventional mortgage on the rest, right? Try and get as large, higher yeah. leverage mortgage as I can because the mortgage rates will be low and that'll bring down the average cost of lending and reduce the liquidation risk as well because the Bitcoin secured part is then percentage-wise small. So I think that's the kind of interim thing. The BMN, you know, because it's, normal collateral, you might be able to get directly lower rates on it if you give it to a broker. You just got to find some type of mortgage house that understands all of this and understands the risk associated with that type of collateral being used. And it seems like that's the biggest hurdle right now is finding a company like your company that can bridge that gap and provide that offering to the clientele that I think is exploding right now um, all around the world that's demanding a product like this, but it just doesn't exist because we're just so early. Um, but yeah, yeah I, man, I hope you guys pull it off. Soon you might be going to add them back to get a mortgage loan. I, I, I hope so. I mean, <laughs> to be quite honest with you, I mean, anybody who's, who's selling their Bitcoin right now to make a substantial purchase like that, I think they're crazy. I think they're nuts, but yeah, obviously, agreed. obviously we see the world through a different lens than most people. So the lightning network seems to be uh, just taken off right now. It seems like there's numerous incentives that are driving this adoption and this use. Um, we're seeing it with the rewards cards. We're just seeing really innovative wallets that are enabling lightning transactions. I'm kind of curious to hear what you guys think is like one of the driving forces of why lightning is taking off at this point. And then any other thoughts that you guys have on kind of where you see it going as far as like a projection into the next year or two? Uh, yeah. So we've, um, you know, Blockstream is one of the sort of three main developers of our lightning core protocol. So the C lightning team at Blockstream has been uh, working on core protocol work, but we've also released recently is something called Greenlight, which is an interesting uh, server-assisted way to, to do Lightning. And the trade-off is it provides the same kind of um, improved reliability and lower latency that you get from a hosted Lightning wallet while actually having the keys yourself. So how it works is we... Uh, we modularize C Lightning. So there's a module called HSM, which contains the keys and does the key operations. And normally that's just a software module inside C Lightning. But what we did is a separate those. So you have that key management on a client. It can verify enough to be secure. And then the server is sort of doing the routing, staying up to date with the uh, network state, tracking the status and uh, uptime of nodes. And so when you come to make a payment, it's much faster and there's less 
kind of traffic going backwards and forwards uh, to between a client. And some of the clients are, you know, intimately connected or low bandwidth devices. So that will generally make for a more reliable experience. So we announced a couple of uh, launch partners who are using it. We hoping that we'll see, you know, more lightning software companies use that as a way to improve lightning. Um, certainly lightnings, you know, assets in network and uh, growth rate of that have been increasing greatly. I think it's, it's proven to be pretty good for kind of uh, lower value retail, faster, faster payments. And you certainly saw a lot of interest in that in El Salvador. You know, that's primarily driven off of lightning. So Adam, help me understand the tech. So you said server assisted. So I have my own full node here at the house. Um, if I didn't want to go out and set up my own full node, I can basically outsource this to a server that you're running, but yet I'm still holding the private keys. And so you're basically running the node for me, but yet I still have control of, of the part that's important. Is that yeah. am I understanding that correctly? That's right. That's, yeah, that's exactly it. So like, most people are using SPV wallets now, so they're just uh, they're not running their own full node, but you know their keys are still on their phone or, or on their device, and you know you're really using you know, some Electrum server somewhere else. So in in some ways, this is a, a parallel of that. So you have your own your keys stored locally, uh, perhaps on your phone, and then you know, Blockstream is running this uh, Lightning infrastructure in the cloud. And the great thing here is that it solves one of the biggest problems, which is channel management. So mm -hmm. like we don't have this right now, but down the road, we will be doing a lot of that balancing and channel management for end users. So you don't have to deal with that complexity. Uh, you won't have to worry about being able to route uh, payments successfully and you know, all that stuff that you want to abstract away from the end users. For them, the most important thing is lightning just works. I can just pay someone if I have enough money in my wallet and it'll just work perfectly. So I think this is a really good step because with Greenlight, you can also take that node in the cloud and run it locally when you are you know, more established and more familiar with all this stuff. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. You can onboard the beginners into this uh, system and they can offboard. And all the while they have their own keys and full control over their funds. So you had mentioned uh, the channel management and for people maybe not familiar with how complex this can get, um, just kind of give a generic uh, example of what you mean by the channel management. And then also, I know there's a lot of work right now taking place where people are trying to come up with like statistical models in order to find the, the fastest path for larger scale transactions. Like if I wanted to send $5,000 over lightning, it's extremely difficult today just because of the channel management issues. But based on some of these new algorithms that people are coming out with, you're going to be able to conduct a transaction of that size fairly easily and fairly quickly through like these dynamic models that are then able to sniff out where there's uh, channel capacity in order to route this through multiple different nodes. I think one of the um, problems is that as a new user, when you connect a channel, uh, you fund it, and that means you can send Lightning Bitcoin, but you can't receive because you can only receive if there's funding coming towards you. So we've been working on a few things. I think C Lightning was the first to have uh, dual funded channels. So you can uh, create a channel where there's funds coming from both sides. So sort of like a coin join going into a channel in a way, a uh, spend from both parties uh, to set it up. And so the... The channel capacity is kind of somewhere in the middle. Um, the other problem that sometimes occurs is that the, you know, the spending habits are pushing all the funds towards one end, and so your channels get imbalanced. And in theory, you should be able to rebalance them by sort of, you know, if I have two channels and one is getting low, I can kind of send money to myself from out one channel and in the other channel via some other people. And that, that, that's the theory, but in practice, um, it tends to deplete channels in between. So you're kind of, you know, try, trying to do a complicated uh, rebalancing uh, job there. So that's, that's where it gets uh, more interesting. And then the capacity issue you mentioned where, 
people would find that as you increase the amount you're trying to spend, it would get less reliable. And that's because, you know, there'll be some channels that you might route through that don't have enough for that payment. And so there's been some work in the last year or so on these uh, multi-path payments where you can pay somebody with parts of the liquidity coming via different channels. So if there are enough, enough channels, then that, that will work also. So right now, when I look at uh, wallets that you could have on your phone, it looks like Mun and uh, Blue are some of the best like user interface type uh, wallets for Lightning type transactions. I'm curious because I know you guys have a green product. You also have Aqua. Uh, I'm curious if you're going to be bringing some of those types of capabilities from a user experience kind of vantage point where it's just, I don't have to think about it. <laughs> I can just do it. Um, is yeah. that in the works or kind of where are you guys at with, with your thinking on that? Definitely, we want to get it into green and aqua. We want to you know, give access to blockstream green, uh, green light in those two wallets. Okay. Yeah, and I mean, in some ways, it's, uh, it's a simpler program model. So I think it should simplify uh, integrating Lightning into a smartphone wallet. And I, I, don't, I don't want to... So as far as I know, at least... Uh, until you know, last year, maybe it's improved now, but Blue Wallet was kind of custodial, right? So it's the server-side model. Um, and so I think people do that because of the usability, mm -hmm. uh, you know, lower latency, high reliability. And I think also they can kind of share channel capacity so they can have fewer channels, so less, less things to rebalance. I mean, one, one factor we're rebalancing as well is the cost because... You can, you can rebalance channels, but if you have to create a new channel that incurs main chain fees, and when the traders get busy in a bull market, the uh, Bitcoin main chain fees get pretty high. So with, uh, with Blockstream, we also have the Liquid Network and Sea Lightning. Well, Lightning can in principle work on top of other chains. So we have Lightning on top of Liquid as well. Um, and that's a way to... You know, get get lower fees and potentially channels with other assets in them, like a channel with Tether, for example. So for people that are using Tether, uh, often that is for trading or even business-to-business -business transactions internationally because it's a cheaper, faster uh, wire transfer, basically. Um, but, you know, for, for the smaller payments, if it gets used for that, case, that kind of use case or for more scale, then uh, Lightning... Tether or Liquid is, uh, is another uh, distinct possibility or other stable coins. You know, there's also the Canadian dollar, the Euro as a Euro stable coin by Sideswap. And uh, there are a number of stable coins. There was a person on uh, Twitter asking about mesh nets. Um, I'm, I think we're still talking about kind of the si same technological space here, but make me smart on, on mesh nets. So there is um, some sort of uh, emerging market concept that people try to build, which is to use the Blockstream satellite to get um, the bulk data. So, so they'll have a situation where uh, high capacity bi-directional internet is expensive. And so with the Blockstream satellite, we're sending the history to sync a Bitcoin node. And more recently, we also added uh, Lightning gossip data. So you can keep a Lightning node up to date on, on the satellite. And then you still have some like direct connectivity because the satellite service on offer to you know, buyers of the base station today is receive only. So they're going to be using bandwidth, but it will reduce their send bandwidth, which will be going over you know, 2G or 3G, which is uh, locally expensive in some markets. And so one concept was to use mesh networks or Wi-Fi hubs to repeat and broadcast that through a local area, through a village or a, a marketplace or something like that, so that you could share the bulk satellite data for running a full node or participating in the Lightning Network. And so the mesh is it's very interesting technology. Obviously, it's a, a way to kind of have a 
onwards broadcast repeating kind of peer operated network rather than a conventional network operated by uh, you know a cell phone provider or something like that. It's kind of a peer to peer internet, and then we also have a we we have a integration with Gotenna, so they are a, a producer of little mesh net dongles, so you can actually use that already uh, in the wild today, and you use Gotenna with Blockstream Satellite to uh, send a transaction through a mesh net up through the satellite. And, you know, there's no need for internet at that point, really. So that's fascinating. So are you guys using the Wi-Fi signal then to do that? I, I know, Samson, you just said this Gotenna, so I don't know what frequency that's operating on. But so your, your, your satellite is broadcasting the signal of the blockchain, right? Then it's hitting some type of hub. You're using Gotenna or even a Wi-Fi router to then distribute it uh, throughout whatever community? Is, are you using the Wi-Fi signal or are you on different bandwidths? What do you guys use? So the GoTenner is a different spectrum. But it's wireless network. Wireless network. Yeah. Wireless, okay. So it's hop by hop. And so the concept is that, you know, you'll, you'll find your way through the network. And if it's a message that needs to go to the internet proper, somewhere in the mesh network will be people running 3G data or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, part of the concept that, uh, GoTenner are also interested in is uh, micropayments using Lightning itself, so that the you know, the use of this peer-to-peer -peer bandwidth can be managed, you know, not saturated by one user or something like that. So it's a way to do quality of service uh, metering. That's fascinating, and uh, I would think that there'd be a huge demand for this in smaller towns, remote locations, whatnot. I mean, wow, interesting. I didn't know you guys were uh, working on that. Um, We're working on a lot of stuff. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, I'd say you guys are working on a lot of stuff. Um, speaking of working on a lot of stuff, I know the the El Salvador announcement was just kind of making the airwaves whenever Adam and I talked last. I'm curious if they've reached out to Blockstream or you guys have reached out to them in reference to doing the mining there with the volcano or any other type of activities down there because... I mean, if it's now legal tender in the country, I would imagine that they are trying to set up as much infrastructure as possible. So I'm curious what you guys have or if, if anything. Yeah, right now our discussions are mostly around uh, the bond. So we had to call with them uh, a couple of weeks ago to talk about potentially doing uh, bonds on the liquid network uh, using our asset management platform. So that could be an interesting way for them to tap into some more of that uh, the geothermal energy that's powering uh, a lot of their grid right now, but it is costly. So I think what you would need to do is um, sell a bond, take some of the proceeds from the bond and build up more of that energy generation infrastructure mm -hmm. and then uh, get into mining. And I think proprietary mining would be the best bet because uh, geothermal power is typically more expensive than, than say hydro. But if you're just prop mining and let's say it is a component of that bond offering, um, like, like the bond is backed by some portion of hash rate, then I think it'd be fine if the cost is higher than, say, hydro. Yeah, I, I, think, your, uh, I think your new model here by selling hash rate via a bond vehicle is just going to flip fixed income on its head here. It just, it just needs more time. Like anybody in the fixed income space that's ignoring this is holy moly. It's always that way. Like, uh, you know, when you're pushing at the uh, the boundary of uh, all this technology and yeah. innovation, you, you can do a lot of interesting things that most people in, in traditional markets will not really think about because, you know, that's not available to them, right? They can't yeah. really securitize hash rate. Yeah. Yeah. Give it a couple of years. Hey, I wanted to ask you about um, just the gaming industry in general. Um when am I going to be able to like watch a Nintendo game and, and like, instead of running around collecting Mario coins, we're running around collecting uh, Satoshis. Like <laughs> what's, what's this progression take? Because you guys are obviously at the forefront of this idea. Um, there's some other companies out there that are starting to incorporate sats via lightning network uh, into their games. Uh, I saw Will Reeves had a really cool announcement where he's basically doing Pokemon Go with, but with his Fold app, you can walk out in front of a store, say it's Starbucks, they can go out in front of their store and like literally sprinkle some AR 
augmented reality Satoshis in front of their store. And then anybody who has the app can see that there's there's free Satoshis in front of the Starbucks and I can go over there and I can walk into the store and, and order a coffee and collect some Satoshis off the ground. So, and like, that's already happening. So yeah. how does this evolve into like the major gaming companies? And do you see this kind of, what's this trend look like? Just kind of give us some of your thoughts, Samson. Well, the, the playing field's wide open. I think we're still in the very early days of uh, applying a lot of this technology into the gaming and entertainment space even. Um, there's Zebedee, I think they're the ones pushing forward on a lot of the you know, play for sats, uh, integrating it into a lot of mini games and things like that. Um, there's also the NFT contingent. I saw some people commenting on your Twitter thread saying talk about NFTs. Uh, well, uh, I think Light Knight has a lot of their game items as NFTs and then my game Infinite Fleet, we're also pursuing the NFT route. Uh, we're also adding a cryptocurrency for the game currencies. So replacing World of Warcraft Gold, but with a crypto asset that is fully portable and can plug into you know, all this ecosystem built up around Bitcoin. Because as a liquid asset, you have access to all that. With uh, you know, Blockstream Jade, you can set up a multi-sig and store your game currency in a multi-sig wallet, which is very interesting. Um, you can conduct uh, atomic swaps for the, the game NFT, so the ships for the game currency. So you don't need uh, a trusted third party to intermediate that transaction players can fully transact peer to peer. And I think that opens up a, a new model where you know, trade can be greatly expanded and you don't have to worry about getting ripped off in a trade. Okay, so your aqua wallet versus your green wallet, do you see, and, and maybe I'm characterizing this the way I'm thinking that it is, but I'm, I'm more asking this, that the aqua wallet, do you see this more of an NFT type um, I'm playing this game and it's giving me these tokens and I can brace, basically bring those tokens into my Aqua wallet and swap it into Bitcoin if that's what I ultimately want to hold versus that that token. Is that how you guys see Aqua playing into it versus green, which is just purely uh, a Bitcoin wallet? Like, What's the difference between those two? Well, both Aqua and green support uh, Bitcoin and Liquid. Mm -hmm. I think Aqua aims to be more seamless, so it's all in one view. So you see Bitcoin... Uh, liquid Bitcoin and all the liquid assets as if it mm -hmm. was one thing, even though it's two chains. Whereas in green, you're toggling between the two different chains. Mm -hmm. And I think green is aiming more towards power users, like people concerned more about privacy. Uh, you know, we have uh, uh, Tor functionality in there. But Aqua, I would say, is more leaning towards um, you know, surfacing these liquid assets, uh, having on ramps. So we have integration with Wire in Aqua. And I'd like to get more and more things plugged in there. I think uh, there's a number of uh, different exchanges that now have uh, you know, buy Bitcoin easily, easy on ramps. And there's things like fast Bitcoins. We want to integrate uh, side shift, side swap, just ways to convert assets easily in Aqua for you know, people that are, are more interested in assets than just you know, super secure Bitcoin storage. Now I interrupted you. You were finish your thought if you can remember where I interrupted you on the gaming side. Yeah. So it's just really like where we can see it going with uh, you know, this technology, uh, crypto assets, lightning, sats, and NFTs in the games industry. So uh, I think there's just a, a great potential here to integrate a lot of this technology to facilitate trade, uh, facilitate more open markets around these ecosystems. Um, I think it's difficult to like the holy grail is people will think you can take one, buy one item in game A and take it into game B. I think that will be challenging just because of the business model around that. You know, yeah. if I'm yeah. electronic arts, I don't want, you know, a Ubisoft player to take their gun into my game because that's a lost sale. But what we could see is, you know, within the umbrella of EA games, they can have, uh, you know, free flowing assets because that's all their own ecosystem and business. And you would see the same like for Ubisoft or Activision you know, or for Exordium, which is what we're trying to do too with the INF currency and those NFTs. Do you really think that they need a blockchain to do that? I mean, you're seeing a lot of this in the gaming space right now where they're managing whatever ledger they've got for uh, whatever scarce digital items they have in their game. Does it really have to come to a blockchain or is there a big incentive for them to uh, enforce through encryption that the scarcity of this is, is maintained? It just doesn't seem to me like, like that would necessarily be the case. Well, yeah, I think I think it's like a interoperability level 
Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. you know, you could uh, use a central web server from the game producer potentially, but then that's not going to integrate very well with, uh, you know, a crypto exchange or a wallet. So it's, it's a kind of online account, right? So I think cryptocurrency and Bitcoin introduce people to a different model of thinking about things. So then being able to treat other assets in that way is, um, you know, it's convenient, I guess. And it also makes it verifiable. So, you know, we've been talking about them as NFTs, but essentially they are game artifacts that you can, you know, bring out into a wallet. You can gift to somebody, give somebody uh, an artifact. Um, you can sell it, you can swap it, or you can put it into the wallet, then you put it back into the game. So I think it's a kind of open network, um, you know, trying open network theory on games because traditionally they've been quite controlling. You know, they try to deter or prevent people from buying things or farming, you know, mining things by uh, employing people to play the game and then sell the, sell the items on a gray market. So rather than fight it, it's kind of embrace the open networking and, and see where that goes. And I think that's a more user-friendly thing to do, actually. And generally, in other segments, open networks have tended to win because it enables more third-party innovation. So it's easier for somebody to make you know, uh, an auction site or a swap site or a swap wallet, and it will, it will all work together, right? So it, the same technology can be used for swapping you know, tethers for Bitcoin as swapping you know, swords for Bitcoin and, uh, and technology-wise. So, you know, for example, the side swap wallet has an integrated uh, marketplace where basically users can enter orders, so they can they can build their own market for an for a, for an asset that side swap didn't you know uh, directly support, but just a user set up market. Yeah, I think they have a B Jade on side swap now. I saw something like that. Cool. Yeah, but the. I, to answer your question, I think it's really about that permissionless element. Um, you could do something and you know use some signing or whatever, but ultimately, if you're not using something like Liquid, it would still be in a central repository or a centralized system, which is prone to you know abuse and control by whoever's you know, managing that system. And the problem is when you get into things at scale. Um, you, 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 you have the Apple App Store thing where you know, they control all the apps now. And it wasn't like that in the beginning, but you know, when that system grew and they achieved that level of dominance and ubiquity, then you know, they're effectively now the gatekeeper. But if you are using something like Liquid, you kind of guarantee that that's external to that, you know, say, game company, right? They'll never be able to you know, grab your assets or lock your account and take your funds from you, right? You'll have that in your non-custodial wallet. Um, and ultimately, it just gives people back control over their their, their things, right? Whether it be Bitcoin, um, USDT, or you know, a game sword, or a spaceship, or a game currency. And the, the goal is really just to make things more bare, to go back to that uh, that system that existed before you know, everything is centralized in a database. You know, things are yours; you have it in your in your control. So I really respect both of your uh, technical expertise. And so I'm curious what you guys think about something like Stacks, um, trying to do decentralized finance on top of Bitcoin. Um, Stacks is just one of, of many different things out there that are trying to do this. You have Rootstock, um, but it seems like any solution that, that pops up has another token that's associated with it that then is trying to peg itself either to Bitcoin or it's just its own standalone protocol at its own base layer. So I'm, I'm curious how you guys view this and how this is going to mature. And I keep hearing rumors that, you know, DeFi can find its way through somehow on lightning. How do you guys see this kind of playing out long-term? Yeah. I mean, I think that um, John Pfeffer has an interesting, uh, it started, it started as a, a kind of a collection of thoughts for himself and he shared it with some friends and it went viral. So it's called an institutional investors take on uh, cryptocurrency, something like that. So it, it basically describes um, his analysis and thesis that Bitcoin is an asset class 
and that utility tokens that are used to you know, create smart contracts or store names or, or whatever the features of alt chains that are, um, won't ultimately hold on to value. So his his argument, amongst other uh, amongst other arguments, is that the uh, it doesn't make sense on a business level to pre-buy um, a utility token. It'd be, it would be like you know you decided to buy a million bus tickets. Well, you're not going to do that. You're going to buy the bus ticket when you need the bus ticket. Mm -hmm. You may might buy a week pass, but that's about it, right? So, and generally, the thing that you're buying. You know, networks get cheaper, disks get cheaper. So if you were to, you know, pre-buy bandwidth in 1990 for the next 20 years, you'd have a very bad time because you'd have paid a fixed price and the price has fallen by, you know, multiple orders of magnitude since. So I think that, you know, his, his argument is that businesses that want to use the smart contracting features of a particular chain it would make sense for them to to buy the utility tokens to to use it just in time. Right? Otherwise, they have the inventory cost, which is which is not helping them. So, of course, that's you know kind of there's a lot of marketing around it, and that has supported higher prices. But if we accept that that's the economic fundamentals of it, then you know, the market can't remain kind of irrational indefinitely, and it will come back to you know, the incremental network cost rather than the speculative value. And so I think that, you know, Bitcoin is different in that regard in being a digital commodity. So Adam, you're basically saying, and I want to get over to you, Adam, but basically what you're saying is this whole 1559 update to Ethereum where it's, it's claiming to be ultrasound money can't last. You're, you're saying that it has to debase itself in a way where it can't be deflationary are you is that what you're saying well i mean the the collection of uh, alternative chains there are on something like ten thousand of them now it's, mm -hmm. it's growing rapidly right so clearly there is not in that that much scarcity and i think it's been a while since i looked but somebody was producing graphs of you know a huge collection of coins versus Bitcoin. And, you know, across a two to three year period, they would go up and they'd go down and then new ones would cycle in. So that's, you know, it's generally sort of coins go out of favor, basically. The, the people that started them or promoted them move on to the next thing and the price is full. So I think that it's, uh, you know, nobody's debating that smart contracts are interesting. But what they're saying is that the, the value is a kind of network uh, utility value. So, you know, what does it cost in the network? And if it gets too expensive, they switch chains. And you see quite a bit of that going on today. You know, when people are moving uh, Tether, they'll switch to other chains um, readily. You know, so it's kind of like, you know, you've got a search engine, another one's better, they'll switch. Another one provides more accurate results, they'll switch. So, it shows that the switching cost is not very high. Um, if the fees go up because things get congested, they move to another chain. Generally, there's this new acronym, which is uh, the DINO, the decentralized in name only. So I think that actually, in terms of utility, the DINOs are, are you know, the, the more centralized, the better in a sense, you know, they can market it as being decentralized, but if it's very centralized, it's easier to scale. Well, easier to put a high throughput because you know they can put high speed computers in a data center, basically. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not very, um, I'm sort of bearish on the long term value potential, even though I'm bullish on the use case of smart contracting and innovation about that. And so people need to, I think, separate the, you know, the fundamentals of the economics from assuming just kind of, uh, I, I would argue groundless inference that because there's utility in a network, the price should go up in a 
there are multiple networks. These are open source networks. People can copy them ad infinitum, and they are. And so I think that you know the cost will fall to the network operating cost. Um, and there's lots of competition. So, so it should, we should ultimately get an efficient market. Samson? Yeah, so, you know, I don't think you need to add a token onto any protocol. And the Liquid Network success is a testament to that fact, uh, that you don't need to bolt on some token to make something successful. In fact, I think bolting on a token generally will pervert incentives. It, it's good short term, you know, you know, people, you quickly align people to be interested in the price of this thing and you can gain, gain adoption quickly. But I think for us at Blockstream, we're in it for the long term. We want to build something right the, the first way around. So, you know, we didn't add a token to Liquid. There is no token. We've grown to 1.1 billion in assets in the network. And we see a lot of uh, growth in that ecosystem too. People building on this protocol because it is open and permissionless. Anybody can become a member of the network and build on top of it. So you have things like TDEX, SideSwap, you know, uh, they're all heavily leveraging this huddle huddle too. I think they want to build a, a version of their platform that's based on Liquid and same for BISC. Uh, because it makes sense. And I think ultimately a lot of these other projects miss the mark. If you're building something now for whatever reason, if it's uh, for smart contracts or whatever, great. But if you're not including some privacy enhancements to it, it's really just this more of the same thing. It's more of the legacy system and in a new technology format, which is not very interesting to me. I think without that added uh, dimension of privacy, then it's really just meaningless. It's not going to survive any, uh, any attacks or any threats. Uh, it just will crumble when, when, the, when they're put to the fire, right? Like Adam said, it's decentralized in name only. Uh, I think to gain that uh, order of magnitude in functionality, you do need, need that privacy component, right? Uh, you need something better. So if you have a smart contract, you still want to have that privacy. Like the way that we're trying to build some things is that, you know, you can have that smart contract, but you don't need to reveal it to the world right away. You just can reveal it as needed. Uh, you know, and Adam can speak more to that because that's more his ballpark. But I think for everything that we're doing, privacy is a key part of that. So the Lightning Network, it improves privacy for all those transactions. The Liquid Network has confidential assets and transactions. And I think what we're going to be doing with smart contracts will also have a degree of privacy to that as well. And to the point, Adam, you were bringing up, I see it uh, very similarly as you with respect to the deflationary uh, token part of it and how that does not benefit somebody who's using that protocol in a commodity or have, having utility that you're paying for the processing associated with that protocol. So I see it similar to just how you see fiat currencies interacting with each other today, like the euro versus the dollar. If the dollar is debased and it's inflationary and um, it has all those attributes, it's sucking euros into the US because Europeans can now get cost of, of products and services way cheaper than what they could before. So that utility through the debasement of the dollar has forced other currencies to come into it and, and to uh, be used. And I think that you might run into a similar dynamic. And I think this is what you were describing when you were talking about your concerns with something that would be a deflationary token on these protocols is you're not incentivizing the use and the utility of the smart contracts that are then happening on that protocol. And you're actually incentivizing the other protocols that are trying to do all this stuff at the base layer to be used. Is that, am I describing that accurately? Well, I'm, I'm just saying that um, I, this, this is John Pfeffer's argument, but you know, you can arrive there through different, I uh, think about it from different directions or from a technology direction as well. But Basically, that um, the transaction uh, cost in the network. So I, th I think there's two two aspects to the value. One is the utility value, like how how valuable is this transaction? You know, what economic benefit did you get from it? Could you run it cheaper somewhere else? And there are many compatible and competing platforms, right? So that means the fundamental 
value if you shop around and look for the cheapest way to run it is pretty low, like cents or something. And yet there are people marketing these tokens as, you know, something of lasting value, but it, does, it doesn't make fundamental economic sense. So I think markets can, you know, sustain a price that doesn't make sense uh, for a while, but eventually, you know, the fundamentals kick in and you see that with something like, you know, I think some of these markets are a bit inverted. So, you know, why, why did yeah, GameStop, you know, shoot up in price? Well, it's because a bunch of guys on Reddit thought it'd be funny to, you know, show their combined strength and uh, try to do a short squeeze because they thought it was, uh, you know, because they knew it was heavily shorted. Now, maybe it deserved to be heavily shorted, but they knew it was so heavily shorted that they could cause a short squeeze anyway. And so they did that for a while, but obviously, you know, that failed ultimately. And things, things. so it's like gravity, you know, something will tend to fall to its fundamental value. And so I think, you know, the fundamental value is just really, what does it, what does it cost? And it, it should get cheaper in future. So, you know, if, if the utility token is covering, you know, the cost, because there's a lot of competition, the utility value should just encompass the cost of providing the operation. The cost of providing the operation goes down over time. So the fundamental value should fall over time. So it doesn't make sense to pre-buy tickets into it. Um, so that, that's it really, you know, I think the rest is kind of marketing or people maybe misapplying um, company valuation metrics, right? So they will, you know, look at the assets that the foundation behind a coin has and think that, you know, the coins represent ownership of those assets. I'm pretty sure they don't, you know, on a legal basis, right? They're not, you know, if, if, if you buy shares in a company and it has assets, of course, there's a liquidation value and ultimately you could have a hostile takeover where somebody could buy enough shares and, you know, get the assets. And that happens in the physical world from time to time. But there's definitely, I'm pretty sure that's not the case with, you know, any uh, kind of ICOs or coin tokens. So people have applied those metrics to it. And so I think it's just, you know, temporary uh, valuation mistakes. And of course, there's a kind of shared incentive to do that because it's uh, people enjoy trading. So I think they will, you know, play along because, uh, you know, being able to buy something, uh, you know, there are sort of early stage investors and so they can make money on it based on naivete of later investors, I think. Or it's just pure speculation. Yeah. Okay. This is my last question for you guys. Uh, this 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 infrastructure bill. What are your comments on just the regulatory policy uh, takes that you're getting out of the SEC with Ginsler? Um, you're just hearing a whole lot of takes and opinions as to the direction that this is going. Is it all noise? Is it something to pay attention to? Does it not matter in the long term? Kind of. What are some of your thoughts on on this idea? So I think. Um... It was a bit disappointing, obviously, the way that that went in the sense that it looked like they were going to improve it so that it'd be less uh, problematic. But then it got vetoed at the end for some kind of tactical reason, like a blanket veto of all changes or something. So it just shows you yet again that politics is kind of disorganized and, you know, random last minute haggling. So it's not a good formula to arrive at, you know, uh, considered and sensible regulation that doesn't get in the way of innovation. Um, so that that's a bit messy. Um, I think that a lot of what Gensler is talking about is actually uh, consumer protection. So uh, reading between the lines, it looks like he's talking about uh, rug pulls, hacks, uh, people losing money. I think, you know, while people are making money, they're less likely to get upset, complain to a regulator, join a class action. But if there's a sudden, you know, 90% drop in something or something gets hacked in a large scale, people get upset and regulators get concerned about consumer safety. So I think you can, you know, chalk that up to the ongoing kind of insecurity of a number of chains, really. And it's not clear, you know, I mean, some of them are 
hacks and some of them are hacks in air quotes, like maybe the anonymous people that create it pretended to hack it and actually took the money. Um, or some of them are just, you know, centralized. So essentially the people who set it up could take the funds at any time and they chose to do so. Um, and so that happens too. So there's, there's a range of, you know, or, or another one is people involved in it just selling heavily shortly after, you know, exchange listing or something like that. That will bring, you know, that will upset, you, upset investors. So in a conventional world, there are, you know, um, I mean, maybe they're imperfect, but they're intended to be consumer protection rules, you know, about share lockups after IPOs and audited accounts for companies honesty and advertisement, uh, disclosures and things like that. And those are, as I say, they're imperfect, but they arose from previous century uh, rampant stock scams at the beginning of the last century, basically. So they are, they are intended to be about consumer protection. Samson? Well, I think uh, in the long run, it doesn't really matter. If they get it wrong, they can still fix it. And the whole point of having Bitcoin is that you don't have to care about this stuff. So, you yeah. know, I mean, if you had to worry about what politicians are going to do to your money, then, you know, then Bitcoin kind of failed. Like, and I guess that could happen if you rely on custodial services and whatnot. But the whole point is to have you know, your keys, right, to have them in your possession. And, you know, they can't really mess around with that if they choose to mess around with that. Um, that's the that's the real point of Bitcoin, that you have control of your funds. They're a bearer asset. And yeah, I, I, I think those things just kill industries. They're industry killing legislation that yeah, it just gets rammed through sometimes. You still have ramifications from the NYDFS, right? Like with the bit license, yeah, people are not going to operate in New York under that kind of regime. And that's just bad for people in New York. And if you take the infrastructure bill, if that went through as they had it, and, you know, Americans would suffer and it's up to them to fix it. You know, either you, you go through the proper channels and uh, replace the politicians and fix it or you live with it. That's the only two choices you have, really. At the end of the day, I think Ginsler is a Bitcoiner. It's very possible. What do you think, Adam? Um, well, he certainly has a good technical understanding you know, he was teaching courses on uh, Bitcoin at MIT um, prior to taking his post. And there are videos online. So it's good that, uh, you know, regulation is informed. Um, so we'll, we'll see. I mean, I guess the one of the questions on people's minds is if a uh, Bitcoin ETF will finally make it through the regulatory process and it's it's uh, it's kind of past due in a lot of ways in a sense that I, I assume some Americans are buying the Canadian ETFs of which there are now multiple and you know, there's certainly some multiple in on six the Swiss stock exchange and other places internationally so the US has kind of been uh, held back on that and it's a big market so you know I think there are you know, always some um, uh, Bitcoin ETFs in the application process, uh, people who track these things, but I think there are more than usual at the moment and some new entrants yeah. from established financial players of different flavors, you know, some big based players, on, big players. Yeah. So some based on the um, futures because it's a way to get, uh, I mean, you're basically people are looking at formulaically the reason why previous ETFs have been nominally uh, turned down. And so I think going through the future gives them access to the CME market, which is harder for the regulator to criticize. Mm -hmm. All right, guys, that's all I have for you. Um, give a handoff to, uh, if people want to, uh, you know, learn more about Blockstream or whatever, feel free to provide a handoff. I'm also going to have this John Pfeffer article in the show notes uh, for people to check that out. And that was the one that Adam referenced earlier. Um, but go ahead and take it away. Yeah, so if people want to look at uh, blockstream.com and everything is under there. Samson, okay. did you have anything else? Because I know you're in the gaming space. Did you have any game uh, stuff to hand off? Well, you can find Blockstream on Twitter at, at Blockstream. 
we're on Facebook, LinkedIn, basically everywhere. Um, and if you're interested in games and security tokens, you can check out Infinite Fleet, infinitefleet.com. Yeah. All right. We'll have that in the show notes. Guys, thank you so much for making time. I'm always just amazed every time I get a chance to talk to you and learn about all the things that are happening out there with Blockstream. It's just mind blowing. But thank you for making time. Thanks, Preston. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on the next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts on this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below. 